I wanted you to think about that for a minute. I've now put the units in a suggestive form, which is going to help you understand what's going on. MKS units, well, we first did the calculation in centimeters here, but anyway, we ended up figuring out what the upstairs velocity is in meters per second, and that's the key here. The question, as I said before, is how much has the kinetic energy density of the water increased as it went from 0.5 meters per second to 1.2 meters per second. Is that really kinetic energy density? Sure. mv squared over 2, that would be the kinetic, that's a certain amount of kinetic energy of certain mass. But this is rho, which is a mass per unit volume. This is a mass density. When you multiply it by v squared over 2, it is a energy density, a certain amount of energy per cubic meter. What kind of units would that be? Let's look at this. This may surprise you. Energy is, as we know from Physics 6a, is just work. Work is force times distance. So my MKS units of force and distance are newtons and meters. So a unit in MKS of energy would be newton meters. It's also called a joule. Now, if I want a density of energy, like how many joules per cubic meter, that would be newton meters per cubic meter there. But look at this. I have newton meters on top. There's a meter on top, three powers a meter on the bottom. That actually comes out to just what? Newtons divided by square meter. Gosh, that sounds familiar. What is that? Force divided by square meter. Force divided by area. It's a pressure. Do you see now that the change in energy density is a change in pressure? They have the same units. Maybe you'll remember that. Now we'll do the specific problem we have. What's the change in V squared in the MKS units? Well, it went from only 0.5 squared, which is a quarter, up to 1.2 squared, which is 1.44. So let's see, 1.44 minus 0.25. It's about 1.2, give or take. Let's see, that was the change in the square. Now, if I divide that by a 2, that's 0 0.6. So the change in v squared over 2 was 0 0.6. Just have to multiply that by rho. The MKS density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So 1,000 times 0 0.6 is 600. What is this actually? This is a change in the pressure of 600 pascals, 600 newtons per square meter. It's not very much. Now let's do, compare that for example to an atmosphere. What's an atmosphere of pressure? You got it, 100,000 pascals. So this is a rather small fraction. This is even, um, I don't know, it's less than 1%. It's 0.6% of an atmosphere. So not a very big, pressure change corresponding to that uh, fast, the fact that it's going faster now and picked up kinetic energy. The big change instead, I say for last, the big change is the increase in gravitational potential energy, which the water had to go by climbing five meters. That's a lot. Let's look at our formula again. There's the change in the energy density. The density of gravitational potential energy, instead of mgy, it's rho gy. g being 10, of course, in meters units. This is 5, so that's 5 times 10 times 1,000 is 50 times 1,000, which is 50,000. That's serious. 50,000, much more than 600. 600 is negligible. 50,000 is about a half of an atmosphere of pressure. Now, let's see. The water went up stairs and went uphill, so it gained gravitational potential energy, must have lost pressure. So the pressure when it comes out upstairs is no longer going to be three atmospheres, it will be, you got it, 2.5 atmospheres. Well, okay, 2.5 minus 0.06. All right, so that's how you apply Bernoulli's formula. A sort of a visual illustration of this interplay between pressure and kinetic energy is given by the so-called Venturi tube here. This is an application, another application of Bernoulli's equation. I'm not going to do any equations and formulas here. I just want you to understand the physical effect. It's a way to measure Bernoulli's uh, effect at work. So what we have is a, 
a tube which has a wide spot here that has an area cross section A1 and then it narrows down to a tighter spot here where the cross section has gone down to A2. And then to measure this, well, you might, for example, have a little column of fluid here that uh, can be pushed up here by whatever pressure is inside the tube. This drawing looks a little bit funny, doesn't it? This is a way you can measure pressure uh, without actually going inside the tube here. Normally, you remember we looked in a previous lecture at what happens when you have a fluid. This could be water, for example. You have a fluid that's connected to a container that has the same bottom here. And I said, regardless of the shape of the container, the shape of the tubes or whatever, they should have been at the same level, right? Now I'm showing something different. And the difference here is that unlike the previous situation where the water pressure was the same underneath, these uh, these columns. Here Bernoulli says the pressure is actually higher here and it's lower pressure here. Why is that? Because the air that was flowing through a large A1 here was going fairly slowly. Now when it gets squished down to A2, V2 squared is proportionally higher by the, than V1 squared by the ratio of A1 to A2. So it goes, you can see the, red, the green arrow is longer here because V2 is jamming through faster there. It's got a smaller surface area to go through. It still has to jam all that fluid through for continuity. And since it's jamming through faster, it has more kinetic energy density resulting in a P2, which is noticeably lower than the P1 here. Right? It's the, the difference, the drop from P1 to P2 is exactly equal to the gain in rho v squared here. And you can see that visually. It's also the change in pressure corresponds to rho gh. That's the difference in height because that's the difference in pressure underneath this tube, which has a high pressure supporting it, compared to this tube here. One last application is kind of fun. Got the V1 and V2 a little bit backwards, I guess. Let's suppose that you start water in a container at rest. It's a stationary tank here. This could be a big water tank. If, and I would have called it V1, but in this diagram it says V2 is zero. So the water is starting here, almost no velocity at all. When we open a teensy little hole in the side of the tank, a distance Y2 minus Y1 below the top of the water here. And so obviously there's some water pressure down here. We know that. Uh, we knew that from like a previous lecture. So we would expect then the water to have pressure so it should flow out here. Yes, duh. So even though it had no velocity practically in here, when it's pushed on and it's coming out of a little tube here, it should have a substantial amount of velocity. What is the formula? We can solve this with Bernoulli's principle. All we have to do is add up what the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic potential, the kinetic energy density of the water is on this side and say, well, the sum of those two things has to be conserved as it goes through this valve, this tube here, has to be the same on the other side. So the uh, sorry, it's called two, but on the left side here, we have no kinetic energy. There's no kinetic energy density. One half rho V2 squared is zero, because V2 is zero. But we do have quite a bit of gravitational potential energy by this extra height here. Y2 is the height of that water. And so the gravitational potential energy density of the water is rho G Y2. Say this is measured with respect to zero down here. Right down there is the base or the floor. Of course, you could measure it with respect to anything. That would just add a constant to both sides. Anyway, I've set y equals zero to be right down there. Anyway, so this is the total energy density of the fluid before it's released in this little tube. When it goes through the tube now, it's picked up kinetic energy. It's picked up a V1, which is what we're trying to figure out. Well, so this is something we don't know yet, but that's the kinetic energy picked up, one half rho V1 squared. 
How about the gravitational potential energy density of this water? It's lost some, hasn't it? Because now it's gone all the way down from there, right? The water, is, as it's pouring, is coming off the top here. So basically what's happening is water is leaving from this level up here, which is Y2. It's exiting at a much lower level, which is Y1. So it starts out with this gravitational potential energy. It ends up with this much lower gravitational potential energy. It's only Y1, the height Y1 here. Energy density, gravitational potential energy density, rho G Y1. So now you can subtract that away from that. Group the terms, multiply by 2. Div uh, the rows cancel out here. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't matter what the density of the fluid is in this example. It's the same density on this side and on this side. Suppose it's water, for example. It cancels out, and you get Torricelli's theorem, which is he can tell you all I need to know. All I need to know is the difference in the height from the top of the container of fluid down to the exit point, or the spigot. That's y2 minus y1. I multiply that by 2g, take the square root of it, and that is approximately the velocity it's going to exit out the side of the can. So a, a demo I like to do in class is I like to take a big cylinder, a big can of water here, and try putting holes at different places. And you got it. If I put a hole up here, there's not much of a loss of gravitational potential energy, not much of a gain of kinetic energy. So the water comes out at a slow speed. V1 is very small. But as I go further down here, there's more pressure pushing on that water, more and more water pressure. The weight of more and more water ejects it faster, faster, even faster here. And of course, if I went further down, it would come out at even higher V1 if it was coming out of the bottom where the pressure is strongest. That'll get a big acceleration. There's an interesting question if you like little simple calculus maximization problems. You could figure out, well, let's see. The velocity just gets of ejection gets higher and higher here as I move the spigot down, deeper and deeper, lower down. The question is, where should I put the spigot? Where should I punch a hole in the side of the can to have the water squirt out the side and land the furthest away from the container. Which point will give me the longest horizontal distance before the stream hits the ground, hits the floor down here? Well, you could do the calculation here. The horizontal distance that's covered depends on two things. One, it's good to have the water uh, ejected from the spigot at a high velocity. That's good, x equals vt. Let's make v big. So that's the argument why we want to go down here. We want a high ejection velocity. But on the other hand, there's a, a contravailing factor, which is that the distance the water is going to go horizontally before it splashes on the floor here is the velocity times the time. If the water is ejected from a high spigot, it takes more time to fall down to the floor. The water here has a short time before it falls to the floor, and you probably remember that, the, for, the formula for a vertical fall. When you're accelerated under g, you fall a vertical distance, well, from y1 to the floor. You fall that distance in a time t, and the fall is given by 1 half at squared. We're on the surface of the Earth, so a is g here. So the higher up y1 is, the longer the time you have before the stream eventually impacts the floor. So you don't want to go too low because there's not enough time for the water to fall. You don't want to go too high because the water isn't coming out with enough velocity. You can do the calculus problem and just take the derivative with respect to y1. You'll find that x is maximized when y1 is exactly a half of y2. So the optimal place here to have the water go the furthest distance is to drill a hole right in the middle of the can. If you drill too high, it'll go less. If you drill too low, it'll go less. This is the optimum. Anyway, that, that's just an application of this formula of Torricelli, which really is just saying conservation of energy here. If you start with no kinetic energy and you fall a height y2 minus y1, then you're going to convert all of that gh into an acceleration, and that's v squared over 2. So the v1, 
if I rearrange the terms, has to come out this way. This would be the formula for anything that you drop from a height of y2 to y1. That's how much velocity it picked up. In principle, I suppose then, and you can see it, energy is conserved. If this water, with no friction, if we neglect friction and viscosity, if you were to aim this spigot up, that would be sort of a silly thing to do, the water would have such a high velocity that it would shoot straight up until it would stop at, where would it stop at? Yes, you've got it. It would stop exactly right up at y2, because that's how much, then, then it would have no kinetic energy, all gravitational potential energy, because that's how much gravitational potential energy it started with. Remember, when you open the spigot, it's the water on top first that comes out down here. As the water level goes down and down, the velocity here will drop because the water didn't drop as far. So if you want to get, for example, suppose this is a dam. If you want to get the most speed and energy of kinetic flow of your water, you want to have a very full dam that's very high. That'll give you the most energy here. If there's a drought and this water level comes down, you can still run the same amount of water through it, the same number of gallons per minute as before, but you're not getting as much energy because it's not going as fast.